Hello. Uh, uh, my name is Yuri Matias. I'm the lead developer of the Embark framework. I co-authored other tools as well, such as Attersim, uh, which later got turned out into what you know uh, now know as uh, Test RPC. Uh, this is the frame. This is the frameworks uh, development frameworks panel, uh, and also discuss tooling. Uh, we're going to start by asking the panelists to give a brief introduction about themselves, and uh, also. Uh, to tell us what you have been up to this past year. I'm Jack Peterson. Uh, I'm the lead developer at Augur and uh, spent the last year, literally the entire year, developing Augur. Um, and uh, I'm happy to say we just, uh, we just sent our contracts out for their final security audits. So uh, if those... <laughs> Thanks. Um, and so if those come back with green light, then we'll launch. So that's what I've li spent literally all my time on. So. Hi, my name's Andy Millenius. I'm a developer with... Woo! Yeah. Good to see you all. My people, good to see you all. Um, I'm a developer with Dapp Hub. And so we are a uh, self-organizing network of developers who focus on uh, the root problems of dApps. And we mostly make developer tools and other forms of blockchain infrastructure. We have um, some command line tools that make your life a lot easier when you're working with uh, the Solidity compiler and the Ethereum API. And we have a standard library, a provable standard library of smart contracts that has been written with an eye towards formal verification which we also have some specialists working on in the background. Uh, as you just saw me, but screw it. Um, hi, uh, I'm Nick Dodson. So I'm a senior uh, dev at uh, Consensus, and I've been working on a project for a while called Boardroom. Originally, I was working on Wayfund for a while, which some of you may know. Uh, but I kind of stopped doing that because crowd sales are just exhausting. Uh, <laughs> I can't take it. Um, so, uh, and doing ETHJS and a few dev tools and floating around for quite some time. Um, so, it's me. Hey everyone, I'm Connor Svensson. I'm the author of a library called Web3J, which is the Java and Android library for integrating with Ethereum. It uh, provides full JSON RPC implementation, but then also smart contract wrappers, so you can work with smart contracts directly from native Java code and supports tra offline transaction signing, all the, the filters and everything else. I'm also the founder of a company called BLK.io, which is building out tooling uh, on top of Ethereum and Quorum, focused really on making it a lot simpler for um, companies and people who want to work with blockchain technology, but are less technical to kind of make sense of what's happening. Because right now, really, you kind of need to be a developer who understands EVM bytecode in order to make sense of what's happening, and we're, we're trying to address that. Hello. Yeah, so I am Yann Levrault, I'm working on Remix, developer of Remix. So Remix, Remix is a uh, web ID, web-based ID, where you can uh, write smart contracts and run smart contracts as well. So this uh, tool is uh, mainly focused on uh, debugging features, so you can run and debug uh, transactions, and also code analysis. So yeah, we have started this tool like one year and a half ago, and we are in a state where it is used by many people, but we still have a lot to do, and we hope, we hope that in maybe one year or less than one year, we can have something that is really usable. It is now, but we still have so much to do. Thanks. Hi, I am Piper Merriam. Um, I am the lead Python, uh, the Python team lead for the Ethereum Foundation. And I am building out the Python tooling ecosystem for uh, Ethereum developers. Um, sort of a three-pronged thing with Web3PY, which is a counterpart to Web3JS, which you guys heard about uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, Populous, which is a uh, development framework for smart contract developers and then related to those is the package management and ether packaging up smart contracts, uh, the tooling to support that effort. 
So uh, development tools are often created to address certain needs or to overcome certain obstacles. Could you, tell, could you guys tell us what's your origin story of sorts? Uh, why did you create uh, uh, your tools? What circumstances uh, led to that? Okay, I guess I'll start. Well, I guess the, most of the tools that we've created have the same origin story, which is just that uh, when we got started, there really weren't any tools. So by and large, we ended up rolling our own stuff. Yeah, that's pretty much long and short of it. <laughs> so um, I think Jack is right when it comes to the uh, command line tools, definitely. But um, a point to add, uh, specifically as it relates to our smart contracts library, we wanted to make something that was generic and something that was repeatable and something that would benefit the entire ecosystem and something that's easy to share. And when we solved these problems, we didn't want to solve them in bespoke ways that would never be useful again. So um, a lot of what we've been doing over the last two or three years has been thinking about what is, thinking about striking a balance between being sufficiently generic and repeatable and useful, but not spending all your time on this and um, actually moving forward with your application and, um, and not getting lost on imagining far-flung uh, visions of the future about how these things will be used. Well, that was great. <laughs> yeah. Um, anger and frustration and sadness and like days of confusion and like questioning my own personal identity um, and why I was doing this. Um, yeah, and, and essentially, uh, so the dev tools I created with ETH.js was just, um, I got pretty frustrated with Web3 um, and just wanted to do my own thing that worked for me, um, which is good and a bad thing. Um, and then uh, with things like ETH deploy, I just wanted my contracts to deploy. Like, I just wanted to deploy them a specific way and do it in a sequence <laughs> and, and get the data at the end of it. Um, so yeah, that's definitely my journey. And like when I was initially starting like way back, um, it was like Remix was like a C++ client and like there was nothing and like, Web3 kind of worked and the node kind of worked, but like things didn't really work either. And like, so it was just like any sort of comfort you got from building the dev tools, I think that's just like, um, yeah, it's like a sanity check almost. So, yeah. For me, it was kind of a bit of a disconnect in that there was all this noise in the media about, you know, blockchain, 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 and big enterprises using it. I'd spent the first you know, part of my career working in large enterprises, building on top of the JVM, and really I, I saw a clear gap there in terms of you know, all these enterprises want to work with this technology, but then in the Ethereum ecosystem at that point, all you had was Ethereum J, which was a client, but you didn't actually have the tooling for integrating seamlessly with the JVM, and uh, you know, the goal there was just to address that gap. Uh, so for this tool remix, I would say that uh, we've started a long time ago to work on it and before the name was Mix. And the reason why we did that is that from the beginning, beginning, we will need to be able to debug transactions. So the first use case of Mix and now Remix, which is uh, the latest version, is just to debug stuff and uh, we will need this from the beginning. So it was kind of the first circumstance where we started to build Remix, to debug transactions. Yep. And to continue the theme, uh, solving problems that I had during development. Um, the Populous was the original piece of code that I wrote, and if you look at almost every other library that has shown up from me in the Ethereum ecosystem, it was ripped out of Populous and turned into something generic but every single one of those things was to solve a problem or to um, uh, fix something that I needed in the developer workflow, which is a common thread here. We were living off the land back then. Yeah. Yeah. 
So uh, a lot of tools that we develop are in different platforms, so that they don't overlap. But in some ecosystems, especially the JavaScript one, there's a lot of competing tools. So how important is that uh, diversity? Are we better off uh, all focusing in, in one tool for each ecosystem and make it the best we can? Or, or is it better to, 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 focus, to develop several competing tools and try different, different approaches? I think having uh, a lot of different tools is really valuable, especially because we're not all unified by a programming language in the same way that you are in like the JavaScript um, ecosystem, for instance. So like, for instance, I, uh, our tools work really well um, from the command line and from Bash, and that's kind of how they developed with this like Unix design philosophy, but from the command line. And his tools are designed from JavaScript, right? And so people who like to use JavaScript um, can use his, and people who want to use the command line can use ours. And so there's like different ways to approach the same blockchain. We're all coordinating around a blockchain, but the way that we approach it um, could be completely different. Can I continue? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm very okay with you, and uh, if I want just to add a small thing, I think uh, when we think about uh, libraries, I think it's very important to be able to have a good uh, audition of libraries and good, have good experienced developer that can review libraries. And it's not really needed to have a lot of libraries, but it's very needed to have good libraries. So it's something that we should improve. I don't have so much solution, but yeah, I think it's really important. To, yeah. I, I was just going to add to that as well. I, th I think that there's, there's certain things, though, that can certainly help in this regard, and that's you know, for library developers, uh, you know, making sure that their code's modular, pushing like individual artifacts out there, and you know, there's uh, been a lot of movement in this space, but it's, it's encouraging that, that reuse, because there's that classic problem where people see a library and it doesn't quite do what they want to do, so then maybe they'll go and write it from the ground up because the library that they've seen isn't modular enough to pull parts out. And so I think that that part then as well, the good documentation, at least it ensures that you've got strong foundations there and then people have a bit more flexibility to kind of cherry pick the pieces that they need that do what they um, well, that solve the problems that they have, but then they can build on top of that rather than you know, the emergence of too many you know, competing versions of things doing similar things. I, I can kind of mirror that in a certain sense that um, have th there's a number of different abstractions that need to exist in every uh, um, language ecosystem. We need tools for ABI and coding and decoding, and we need abstractions for just doing the RPC stuff. and. There's all of these different things that sort of do need to be mirrored, and a number of these architectures are kind of already figured out. Um, things that work, they're not necessarily going to translate perfectly to every language ecosystem, but um, there's been a lot of my tooling where the JavaScript ecosystem did the heavy lifting, and we just sort of copied their architecture, and it has worked quite well. So I think it's good that we sort of, what we're seeing the same libraries across different um, language boundaries, but I also think it's good for there to be competition of a sense um, inside of those language boundaries because, well, I, I don't always get the abstraction right and somebody else might come along and, and have a better version of that and that's a good thing, so. Yeah, like, um, I think, uh, I think, um, a lot of this stuff, especially on the higher layers, are really straightforward. Like, there's not many ways you can dance around a lot of these concepts. Like, they're pretty straightforward. It's just how you're going to approach handling data and then how you're going to approach, you know, constructing your library. And I think, I think the message about quality over quantity is definitely right. Like, we shouldn't have, like, a bazillion qu querying layers or something in JavaScript. Um, like, you don't need that. Like, we just don't need that. But I think, um, you know, uh, building them in, in isolated small pieces is, is always, well, at least in my mind, that's been always key um, and um, kind of a motivation for some of the stuff that I did just to break it all down, even if it doesn't get used. Like, I just want to break it down to its smallest, its smallest pieces. But also, like, um, 
you know, then I'll do all this JavaScript stuff and it's fantastic, and then I'll look at like the latest Pythereum, and then I'm just like, ah, shit, like, you know, it's way nicer. Uh, <laughs> uh, just because it's just like, you know, <laughs> there's no, um, there's no depth to the code, like it's literally two or three lines deep and like it's just fucking tests and I'm like, oh shit, you know? Uh, so it's just across languages, I think you wanna also look at what's available everywhere because there's fantastic tooling coming up from different languages at different times and like screw just JavaScript. Like JavaScript's great and it's accessible, but like, you know, Python offers a lot, Rust offers a lot, um, Java, if you're into Java, I can't stand Java, but you know, some people love Java, uh, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd go so far as to say JavaScript is great, yeah. but um, yeah, I mean, I think for you know, di libraries in, in different languages, I think it's completely fine and understandable to replicate one library's functionality in a different language. Uh, within the same language, I mean, I think as long as if you're creating a new library, if there's, you know, it, as long as it's, it's, it's subtly different than an existing library and there's some new niche that it's filling, then I think, it, I think that can be great. You know, I think it's good to have yeah, some degree of competition uh, among libraries. Um, I think one thing that we have to watch out for as you know, people that sometimes author general purpose libraries is that we're not just writing a library because there's a quote from Joel Spolsky. He said that, uh, Code is easier to write than to read. Um, and I, I think that that's true, and I think that uh, that's, that, that underlies a lot of decisions that uh, you know, programmers will make regarding whether or not they should roll their own stuff. And I, I think that that in isolation is not necessarily a good reason. So, uh, so the tools they 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 address a lot of problems that you have, but the, surely there's other problems that uh, you want to solve. Uh, what I'm curious about is what problems uh, have you solved, but you just don't have the time to implement yet uh, the solutions. I'll start. Um, so a number of a number of you may have seen the package management talk from the first day. Um, if not, go take a look. Um, we have a fully baked solution for package management that looks a lot like an app store if you look at it from the right angle. And a lot of it just comes down to more tooling support for the spec, uh, and another ERC for specifying some higher level stuff, and, and just, well, like I said, tooling support. Um, and, and it's not trivial. There's a lot of work to be done. I'm forecasting it's going to take us the next six months to a year to really get to a point where that stuff starts to be usable. But there is that force multiplier effect as, as those tools, the support shows up and we get network effect across different language boundaries and, 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 and things start moving faster. Can I continue? Oh, yeah, yeah, if you want to go first. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, so, so I think you are really right, and for Remix, it's the same thing. We need and we plan and we have thought about uh, integrating and implementing the package manager, and it's like, there is a lot of stuff to do, a lot of uh, work to fix as well, and then, yeah, it's very really hard to, to be fixed in a point and to, and to implement these things, but I hope we'll do that. Uh, I was thinking that, uh, yeah, there is something in Remix that is quite important and we need to overcome that. It's, this is a web app and inside this web app there are different modules and they are kind of independent but they are, but they are still packaged in the same big modules. And we want and we need to split up everything so can maybe some modules can be used inside other tools or inside other web app or I don't know what, you know? And this is something that's, uh, it's a nice example of, uh, for the question, that we need to do, we have to do, we will do, but we always uh, say, okay, we need to do that, but we do that in two months or three months because we don't have, we don't have time or so on. So, yeah, uh, this is, yeah, this example. So, yeah, I think 
the package management stuff for Ethereum, like it's absolutely essential. It's so critical and it's so underused. And um, I think there's a few different reasons why. Um, like even for one, as I read about it and look at it, like it's still not something I want to interact with yet. And that's almost my fault for not making a comments about that because I definitely will. But the thing is, is we need to start using all that stuff. Um, if we don't, you're going to have so many different issues where copying code just causes a bazillion problems. Um, and package management's really, really critical. But I also find that even when using Solidity, there's a lot of interesting dangers coming from just hidden code that's in an import. So if you're importing a bunch of Solidity files and you're smashing them together in a contract, like sure, in JavaScript, if you make a mistake, like maybe it could cost you, your company some time or some processing or whatever. But if you make that mistake in contracts, it's like shipping hardware that's failing or, or failed. And so we know how dangerous that is. So there's a lot of interesting dynamics because in some senses, I just want to copy Solidity code together so I can see the whole damn thing. Um, but then at the same time, I absolutely want to use a package manager and use imports because I don't want to do that because accidents happen and they certainly do. So there's almost primitive things of like visibility across that system that need to be worked on, but also everyone needs to chip in their opinions on why they're not using the package managers right now and what they hate about them and just go nuts. Like just say everything you absolutely hate about them. And I think as well we probably want to study, if not already, because I, I don't know all the research that's been done on that, but the NPM ecosystem and why that was so successful. But then again, with the NPM ecosystem, like how many sh pa crappy packages are shipped every day? So <laughs> um, maybe we don't want to copy that. Maybe we want to have something a little sturdier. So this is definitely, I think, like a big, deep conversation that, that like we've just got to have because this is just not being fucking used. <laughs> it's like a disaster. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, we're, we're not using a, uh, a package manager at the moment, but uh, you know, after this, after this conference, after uh, you know, hearing Piper's talk on it, uh, I, I definitely would like to start using Populous. I mean, it sounds great to me. Uh, I think that, yeah, I think I completely agree with the sentiment that a package manager is badly needed. Certainly, is certainly beats copying, pasting code, like you said. We've been getting by with uh, Git sub modules um, as a short-term solution. It's actually pretty useful, but of course. Nick is right. Um, package manager is badly needed. So to the original question, which was um, about things that we have solved in our heads but haven't had time to develop, a lot of it is in the realm of smart contracts. Um, at DAPUP, we're pretty, we're pretty confident, pretty comfortable with the command line tools that we have, and they're already starting to generate interesting command line tools on top of them. Um, but for the contracts, what we really want to make is just a whole bunch of free dApps. This is kind of what I was talking about in my talk earlier, but we just want to make free versions of things. And a lot of it is around uh, business infrastructure. So things like invoicing and payments and payroll and running our own organizational logic on the blockchain, both for DAPUP and for MakerDAO, which is a project that we're very, very involved in. And so these are things that are fairly straightforward. Uh, I would consider them solved, at least in my own head. And it's things that we just need to, like Yuri said, find the time to develop. So a lot of what we want to, a lot of what I want to get done in the next year is laying down the roads, not necessarily building towns, but laying down the roads for or the logic of organizations on the blockchain. Yeah, I just realized I didn't actually answer the question. Uh, as far as things that we figured out but haven't built yet. Um, well, one big one for us is uh, an off-chain trading system, which I think is sort of the first component of how, we're, how Augur is actually gonna scale. Now, this is a, you know, it's nothing too novel in our case. It's just a, a 0x slash ether delta style system where you've got, you know, basically a, someone who uh, maintains an off-chain order book and people can make and cancel orders with them and then the order matching is done on-chain. So we pretty much know how that's going to work. We just need to sit down and implement it. Um, we, I have had a solution for at least being able to show 
uh, stack traces in your Solidity code when something goes wrong for a while, but there's pieces to be glued together and work to be done. So all of these things are already, the, 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 the components are, are there, all of the pieces are there, they just have to be put together. So. I just want to say too that um, uh, instead of making some random token oriented app that like go and raise five million dollars or something and that's where you're putting your development time because raising money is like fun nowadays, um, and, like easy. Uh, if you can actually contribute to, to Dapp Hub or to EJS or even to Web3 or to these other libraries and spend your time doing that and building your reputation up as a developer and actually committing to the ecosystem, that's worth so much more, um, especially for your long-term reputation and everything. Just tagging yourself to a token project and raising some money is like ridiculous. And like you're going to raise all that money and it's probably going to be bullshit and it's not going to work. So just Instead, you know, fucking spend your time doing something better. Um, but also, like, um, there's some great bounty systems coming up. Um, they're trying to build great experiences to do bounties. And I think, you know, try to engage with those. Gitcoin's one of them. Bounties Network is another. And I know there's a few others. Um, Ethlance and everything. Like, engage those tools and use those. Um, try to get yourself out there and like actually submitting great PRs to things because like we really need the help because we're all fucking inundated with crazy random shit at a con consistent basis. So, so one way yeah. to think about this is, um, so I've heard the phrase, uh, the lottery is a tax on people who are bad at math. Um, startups who are doing token launches are sort of like a tax on developers who are bad at realizing that they're probably gonna be in the 99% who fail. Whereas the people on this stage have a loosely 100% chance of being useful. So if you want to be useful, consider working on tooling. And we're also in a very... Protect your long-term Ether investment by working on tooling. We're, we're in a very unique position in that regard at the moment because as, as developers, you know, you always want to be out there doing new things. You don't want to be taking something that's already there and just, you know, working with the status quo. And there is just so much stuff that needs to be built to, you know, help grow this ecosystem and, you know, get more people involved because the better the tooling gets, the more appealing it becomes to everyone else. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a great time for developers to get into the space. And, and we are still at the ground floor. You did not miss the train. You did not miss the boat. We are still in the very early days of all this. All right, so on the topic of open source, uh, what are the main challenges you, uh, what, what are the main challenges you face as an open source contributor and maintainer? And how do you try to uh, deal with those, uh, with those challenges? Can I start there? So, I, I, for me, I, th I think, you know, getting feedback from the users on the library and knowing what people are using it for, that's very, very hard. Because typically, the main interactions you have with people are when they've got problems or they're raising issues. And the, then the, the other piece is just finding people to contribute. So I think that, you know, you, one of the best things is when, you, you know, someone raises a pull request and they add in some new functionality that, say, you didn't even think about. And it's like, it's, it's the coolest thing when someone just donates their time and does that. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's hard to, you know, build up momentum around the projects and have people consistently come back again and again and again. And, and yeah, just that and knowing what people are you're doing with the library, I think those are the two biggest challenges that I face anyway. Yeah, I just, I would second that. Like, knowing how you're using it and what problems you're running into, how did you start um, your environment? So what environment did you start with? Was it Truffle, whatever? And what kind of led to the lineage of, of your problems? Um, all of that stuff needs, needs to be fully exposed. Opening lots of issues is so good and, um, you know, PRs, yeah, it is just the greatest feeling when <laughs> someone random just shows up and helps, you know, improve your, your stuff. And um, so, yeah, make lots of fantastic, high-quality PRs uh, and, like, kill it, yeah. <laughs> I've had trouble with just ongoing support, and that's just a problem with me spreading myself too thin across too many tools and too many libraries. Um, and 
same with the helping us with pull requests. Um, uh, the users who answer questions in Gitter and respond to issues before I even get there are invaluable to me and, and help so much. But uh, it's hard when, there's, when you're working on a lot of stuff and, and there's a lot of support to be given. It, it's not always our specialty. We're not always great with interacting with people. We're not always great at the, the, the documentation piece and things like that. And, and it's a, there's a lot of different aspects to, to maintaining these things. I would tell you that one of the challenges that, that I see is, well, it's kind of what I said in my talk, which is just that, um, you know, on the one hand, when we release, uh, you know, tools which are intended to be general purpose, and naturally you want to provide as good a support for them as you can, but there's only 24 hours in the day, and, you know, also we've got to get, uh, you know, I have to get my DAP, Augur, to release, so there's a... Uh, you know, there, there's some degree of tension between those two aims. For us, I think that something that's been very difficult in tooling specifically has been um, changing our minds. It's been very difficult to change your, to make a real change in your product after it's out there and after it's open source and after it has users. So our first tool was called Dapple. And it was something, it was a labor of love. I know Nick loved it for sure. He was our biggest number one fan for a while. Um, and it was something that was near and dear to our heart, but for various reasons we decided to kind of pivot to just a different model. You know, we wanted to write it in Bash instead of JavaScript, and we wanted to take a different approach to it, simplify it. But that was difficult knowing that there were people already out there using it, you know, and. There's a, and it was the same thing with our smart contracts, too. We, we've created smart contracts and we've refined them and really thought about them many, many times and changed them many times. And this, all of this stuff becomes magnified when you add in new people into the equation. You know, there's this whole, it's difficult to kill your darlings when you're alone together in a room. It's even more so when you've got a bunch of people who have starred the repo and they're kind of expecting, they have expectations about it. So I think that making tough choices about your tools but for the right reasons has been something that we found very challenging. So the final question, uh, for the next 12 months, uh, what are you most excited about? Launching Augur. Launching Maker. Uh, uh, launching Boardroom, now becoming GovernX. <laughs> Um, I am really excited to get more people onboarded to the Python ecosystem because we, it, it has been a, a it, I don't know what the word I'm looking for here is, but the Python ecosystem hasn't been amazing up until now and it hasn't been well supported and that is all changing. The tools that we're making, we have a team, we have resources and that stuff is uh, going to be worked on, supported um, and we we want that ecosystem to grow. Um, and package management. Uh, I want this next year to be the year that we get support for the spec and across the board and support in wallets and support in explorers for verification and that we actually see that take off. I just want to second that the new Pytherium is fucking rad. It's the shit. Uh, it's also like, known as Py EVM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, Not, it's very good. It's very good. Definitely check it out. Um, yeah, great work. <laughs> yeah, for me, I think it's, it's just seeing where Ethereum's going in terms of like the, the progress that's being made around scaling it and with initiatives like Plasma and, and the, you know, the second chain coming along that Vitalik was talking about on the first day of the conference. I think that's going to present all sorts of new challenges for the libraries in terms of you know, throughput and handling greater volumes. And so it's, you know, it's really exciting times for it. So for us, uh, next 12 months, uh, it will be like testing and uh, splitting down everything into several modules and yeah, really testing, testing, testing. I uh, would like just to, to say that we are proud now of what Remix is. It's really nice. But one aspect that we need to improve is kind of the fact that you can use it in a browser, it's very nice, but if you have to deal with local files, if you have to deal with continuous integration and all those stuff, it's a bit more difficult. So in the next year, we will definitely improve that stuff. Yeah. And to give 
a more thorough answer. Um, something that I'm really excited to see in the next 12 months is um, around formal verification. One year ago, I did not think that formal verification on Ethereum would be as far ahead as it is today. There's like uh, measurable progress being made. Uh, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're working on it um, at Top Hub. There's other people working on it in the space, but it'll be, I'll be very excited to see what happens in the next year on formal verification. All right, so we reached the, f the end of the session. Uh, if any of you want to talk to us about contributing to the tools or even creating your own tools, please don't hesitate to, to come and talk to us. Uh, thank you. <laughs>